Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Third Impact Anime Podcast. My name is Sully, and with me tonight, I have Austin. You may call me Austin, but my real name is Rokor! Okay, and then also with us tonight, we have Tobias. Hey, that's me. And we have, as always, Bill. I have the potential to find the brother I've never had. And uh, as you might have guessed, maybe from the references that they're trying to make tonight, we're going to be talking about the 1968 Toei film Horus, Prince of the Sun, or is it Hulse, Prince of the Sun, or is it Horus, Prince Sully. of the Holes? We don't know. It's, uh, it's a little all over the place. <laughs> I don't mean to undercut you, but I have a feeling like most of our listeners probably are not going to know those references right off the top of their Look, heads. It's called a segue, Austin. they got to work with what you're giving me. <laughs> you're right. Fine. Fair, fair. Um, but before we jump into Horus slash Holus slash Horus, 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 Horus I just whatever. say we just go with uh, Horus. You yeah, I that. mean, so fun fact, I have a friend who's Norwegian and I, I told him about this. He's like, there's no one in Norway named Horus. It, it's Hols. It's Hols, Prince of the Sun. I'm like, you know what? Take that up with, with Toei then. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, before we jump into the movie then, I guess it's time to play a little catch up. Uh, Austin, what are you up to reading, writing watching, consuming. Well, most of my time lately has been dedicated to school junk because I am back in school, but I'm enjoying it uh, pretty much a lot. Um, taking my first uh, Japanese class, which is in the block uh, almost right before Sully's, so we're kind of both in uh, Japanese 101 at, uh, in school, taking our first uh, serious dives into the language, and uh, that's been pretty fun so far. I'm, I'm glad that Sensei is a very... Uh, funny but kind and uh forgiving man despite his somewhat stern demeanor at times um but in terms of actual fun stuff uh, i've seen a lot of movies recently uh our good friend uh jamie turned me on to the streaming service canopy which is that um it's like a streaming service that you can get through your library oh, okay. um, not all libraries participate in it but it's like a free streaming service that like if you have a library card and your library participates you can uh, put in your library card number and have access to I want to say it's like 10 10 movies a month 10 free streams a month and like all of their children's content is free and some of their children's content includes stuff like uh, like Patima Inverted and like some films from like G Kids and stuff. So it's got a little bit of anime on there as well. But uh, it's mostly like documentaries and like educational shows and stuff like that. So I've been um, and like art films, indie things like that. So I've been using that a bit. Uh, watched a couple documentaries, including one on uh, Mr. Rogers that was uh, different from the one that was um, pretty popular like. Uh, a yeah, year or so ago uh, it's a, 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 yeah it was a different documentary than that it was one PBS actually made themselves it was hosted by Michael Keaton so that oh. was pretty cool um, so I've been checking that out um, I've been playing a little bit more on my PS2 lately um, I went and thrifted a bunch of uh, PS2 and Wii games um, that were um, kind of scratchy but I took them to a guy in town that refurbishes discs and now they're working pretty pretty darn well and I've been playing Ape Escape 3 <laughs> I had no idea how much fun I was going to be having with that but it's just like such a delightful game it's like I could easily imagine this like taking off if they ever did like an HD remaster of it. Um, this is my first time playing an Ape Escape game. I'm not really familiar with the franchise overall, other than it's created by Konami, which is probably the reason why it's like not available and they're not making any more of it, to my knowledge. So probably just another another uh, another piece of the uh, puzzle that is Konami. Um, but other than that, in the anime sphere, I've been keeping up with Dr. Stone, which is really good, and we'll be talking about that in our seasonal wrap-up whenever the heck that happens. Um, and apart from that, I've been watching uh, Mushishi, which is really good. That's an excellent show to just, like, put on whenever you're about to go to sleep, just, like, relaxing in bed and uh, just letting that wash over you in the, in the, in the tired hours is uh it's a pretty pretty good uh ethereal experience been enjoying that a lot and uh a couple other things but nothing really worth mentioning and how about you tobias well spending most of my time not watching anime you uh, always say that 
I well, it's true. It never stops being true. Uh, I did catch up a few weeks back with O Maidens uh, in your Savage Seasons, but I'm behind again. It's been a few weeks. Uh, speaking of movies, I just went to see Promare last night. Uh, the dub in theater. Uh, gonna see the sub again tomorrow with uh, most everybody else. And uh, surprising literally nobody, I loved that friggin' movie. It was great. So did it did it trigger as hard as it needed uh, to? It it was the perfect it was the perfect amount of trigger. It was it wasn't too much. It was just right. Mm. Perfect <laughs> amount of trigger. The Goldilocks trigger. Exactly. Uh, but I'm sure we will do a podcast on that. I will make sure that we will be doing a podcast on that. Probably mm-hmm. right after this podcast goes up. I won't talk about it too much. So we look forward to that discussion there. I think I'm the only one here that's actually seen it yet. So it's not really a reason to break into that now. All three of us are going to see it tomorrow. Not together. Yeah. Well, solely not together, but whatever. Yeah. We'll be there in in you know in spirit. Mm-hmm. Our number one dumb firefighter soul burning. <laughs> uh let's see, besides that, uh what else? Oh, I've been playing a little more Dragon Quest Eleven. Uh the Switch release is coming out here next week, and I've been enjoying that demo, just kinda casually playing through it. There is a lot of demo in that demo. Hmm. I think I'm like five hours in the demo, and it hasn't ended yet. <laughs> Very weird for a, a demo uh, version. So uh, I'm, I'm really getting my money's worth out of that. Uh, that being you know free, of course. But so I'll probably as someone, go ahead and pay it. Mm-hmm. as someone who has only played like 15 minutes of Dragon Quest VIII on the PS2, is Eleven a good place for first timers? You have played the exact same amount that I have. Oh wow! Prior, I played oh, like I the same got, person. Yeah, well, I mean, we knew that already. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I bought eight way back in the day and couldn't really get enjoy it after the first you know hour or so. It just wasn't what I was wanting at the time. But uh, I can say, and most people would agree with me, that DQ Eleven is a great way to start the series. Hmm. And uh, it's and it's it's very old school style JRPG combat. But I like the fact that they have that uh, sort of AI option you can turn on, kind of like in Final Fantasy XII. So mm-hmm. it, it lets you just kind of like breeze through the, the, the grunt work of mm-hmm. every little combat as you, you grind up. And it's, very, uh, it's a very casual game besides. I heard uh, somebody mention, I think uh, uh, Tim Rogers on Kotaku talked about this Dragon Quest being a game that you play like an hour before bed every night oh. rather than sitting down and like grinding through a couple hours at a time and just like casually play it like you know after you get out of the bath before bed every night and I'm really enjoying that it gives it more of a fairy tale sort of vibe to this mm-hmm. traditional fantasy story and uh, of course Akira Toriyama's art is is just amazing to look at uh, most, most of us know him by uh, you know Dragon Ball and, and that series, and of course you see Goku and and all those characters everywhere. But Toriyama's character design and his his mechanical aesthetic and everything is just really great. And to see that in a non Dragon Ball setting is is very refreshing. You see, Tobias, when you say you play Dragon Quest out after you get out of the bath, all I can think is, Oh, Sebastian, do bring me my Dragon Quest as I get ready to retire for the <laughs> evening. Thank you. <laughs> You get out and you're wearing a uh, you're wearing a bathrobe and you've got your like uh, little pipe and your and your snifter of brandy or what have you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm going to retire. Uh, Jeeves, please bring me the Dragon Quest. I'm this day has <laughs> has left me betired. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna retire to my study. I mean, why wait until you get out of the bath? Hey, got just the switch. put a just put a gallon sized plastic bag around your switch. <laughs> Or yeah, so or you, get all the you could always just uh, like put the switch like next to the bathtub and then put the little bags around the the Joy Cons and like hey hey I I used to watch a lot of movies while lying in a bathtub. Disclaimer, children, please do not use your switch in the bathtub. Uh, I guess besides that, I'm dabbling in you know a couple of whatever game strikes my fancy whatever night. But uh, thanks to a certain nerd, I may have. Resubscribe to Final Fantasy fourteen, mm. maybe just to get my character on this uh, Leviathan server. I think it is. 
uh, I, I played a, I played a little bit of that, but I've been kind of busy, so I really haven't had time to really deep dive into FF14. But uh, I'll say the same thing I said when I first got it, that I, I enjoy it. It's a fun MMO. Unfortunately, it's an <laughs> MMO, but uh, I, this, I've enjoyed it. Does this nerd's bits. name rhyme with Nasal Nurchakis? <laughs> uh, maybe. Uh, one thing I've heard about FF14, though, is that it's a great MMO for people that enjoy single-player games, which is very much me. Uh, so I'll see how that uh, theory lasts, because uh, I don't really like to play a whole lot of multiplayer games. So if I can get a lot of that experience and that story and a single-player experience, then uh, I think I'll be okay. In non-fun stuff, I've been getting started on applying to grad school so we'll see. congratulations Congrats. that oh, that is congratulations fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes uh we believe in you bill we're sending you our fighting spirit <laughs> thank you and uh organizing and getting rid of a lot of stuff uh that are either mine or my brother's because we need to slim down and not be hoarders <laughs> try uh let's see in fun stuff i've been mostly just been playing prey uh the oh. new prey game from a few years ago at first i couldn't really get into it but i i started to get addicted to it and it's kind of a everyone's favorite comparison uh just the dark souls or just the trial and error of dealing with these alien creatures and uh setting up resources so i've been enjoying that um, watching the seasonal stuff, except for Fire Force. Uh, we'll see if I go back to that. Probably not. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is your own, if you like that show. Uh, and, uh, just, uh, started working on some panels in the f- near future for next year, so we'll see how those go. Any ideas you want to share with the crowd? Um, nothing concrete yet. I'm I'm still I'm still I'm still working them out and seeing if I can actually format them first. Uh, but I will promote one thing that I did do. Uh, in the interim, I did keep my promise, and then I did write a review for GoGo Thirteen, the Professional, which you can go read on our website, ThirdImpactAnime.com. Bill, you said that so uh, aggressively because I want people to read. What's wrong with you? Me? Mean, I mean, do you know what Gogol 13 is about? Uh, yes. Gogol 13. No, I was talking oh, to Sully. Uh, it's nothing oh, but no. aggression. <laughs> or, or, not really. It's more just like Uberman. I am Uberman. He's got that, uh, uh, Duke. Duke's got that, uh, very calm, calm face. <laughs> yes, it's, 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 it's like, it's very resting. It just never moves. Yeah. Uh, but uh yeah you can go read that go read my review of that and uh it's it's uh you can find that movie on uh verve you can find it on crunchyroll and uh as of this recording a lot of stuff from discotex catalog has been added to crunchyroll lately uh like arcadia my youth recently got added yeah. to crunchyroll mm-hmm. so i also really enjoy arcadia my youth so go watch arcadia my youth people it's really fun. If you like someone that is just drenched in uh, melodramatics and just wondering, what should I do? And uh, with some sci-fi into it, you will really like Captain Harlock. I think for all of us, that is like one of the only, if not the only, Matsumoto thing that we've all watched. And we all watched it and loved it. Yep. So it, and it you seems can watch like... The, uh, you can watch the sequel series, uh, Endless Orbit SSX. On Crunchyroll yeah. as well. So if you're interested in, in Harlock or Matsumoto junk, like check out Arcadia My Youth because it's a pretty good entry point. Isn't anyone going to ask me what I've been up to? No. Nah. Well, what that what have you been up to, Sully? So uh, I have finally moved into my new cute little studio apartment that all of you have visited. Um, and I am also, I'm in grad school now. Uh, it's, yeah, like Austin said, our Japanese classes are like, like, his ends, there's an hour, and then mine begins. Um, so sadly we're not in the same class together. 
Uh, I can uh, reiterate his statements. It is a it is a wonderful class with a wonderful professor. Um, and what I've been doing in my free time when I'm not in either three hour night classes or my three times a week Japanese class is I've been watching a lot of Cutie Honey Universe. I have mm-hmm. actually not watched it before, and so I've been uh, borrowing Austin's high dive account. That's that's yeah, we'll use that word. Um, to to watch that, and I, I've greatly enjoyed it. I know that some people were not uh, fans of it, but I think I'm so used to the cheesecakiness of Cutie Honey and kind of where it goes. I'm able to kind of tune that off and enjoy it as it is. It's not perfect, but it's uh, it's something to while away the afternoons after I get done studying or doing homework. Um, I funny enough, I was watching a film before we started recording this, uh, Face of Another, Tanen no Kao, which actually features two of the actors from Horus, so I'll probably bring that up when we get to the cast list. Uh, it's hmm. for my film panel, which has been accepted to Awa, and it was at, it was at 1am, but they thankfully moved it to 11.45pm. So please, if you're, if you're going to Awa, please know that my, my panel is, is going to be at a, at, a, at a decent time now. Um, and I've been playing a lot of, uh, A Link Between Worlds on my 3DS, which I, I've been meaning to do for, for some months now, and every time I'd start, I'd be like, uh, there's probably something else I should do. So, I've actually been pretty good about watching anime and playing games and actually doing stuff for fun and not just, you know, having some stupid Netflix show on repeat in the background or, like, watching dumb YouTube videos, like, over and over. I've actually been, like, consuming media, and so I'm very proud of myself. Um, mm. And I've been reading a lot. I uh, have gotten back into the habit of reading for personal pleasure. I've been reading Minjin Lee's Pachinko and um, Virginia Woolf's Orlando and uh, Yukio Mishima's Confessions of a Mask, which I greatly have basically just fallen in love with. I'm only about uh, 100 pages in so far, but it's, it's a deftly written, even through translation, just a beautifully written uh, piece of literature, and I highly recommend it, especially if you are interested in gay literature or Japanese literature. He's considered one of the great masters. Um, and I've been reading uh, Irisei Yatsura from the from the Viz releases, so uh, oh, you yes. know, tempering you know high you know absolute bungak with uh, Lum <laughs> with Lum, who you know is also you know if I can find a way to tell one of my you know literature professors like you know Hemingway yeah great but Lum have you read her? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about someone who really understands. <laughs> The, the condition of literature, and that is Lum and Vader. Um, if you don't do your, if you don't do like your dissertation on a Takahashi work, I don't know you anymore. Oh, you know, you know the great characters of literature. You know Sherlock Holmes, Ebenezer Scrooge, Holden Caulfield, Lum, <laughs> Ataru. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's 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 funny because I'm actually considering about changing my track within the within the major for graduate school from uh, doing a, 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 a PhD track into doing what they call careers in the humanities, which is where I would actually be able to combine my interest in literature with like film study, queer study, um, and and maybe even be able to draw in like talking about anime or comics in in sort of a literary uh, context, which is something that, like, I feel a lot of trepidation in doing because even though I know people who do things like that, like my, like, uh, someone I really admire and look up to did that, uh, I'm still in this mindset of, like, oh, all of these elderly men, they're going to be looking at my work and be like, what's a lum? <laughs> you know, what is this <laughs> yatter man that he's talking about? Um, in that Batman thing, that thing with Adam, what, like, it's just, it's, I, I'm really in that mindset, so I'm like, I have two, like, ideas, like, I have a real literary idea of what I could talk about, and then I have, like, what I would do if I had my, my druthers, um, but enough of this banter, we've gone on for 20 minutes now talking about our pathetic lives, let's talk about Horace, Prince of the Sun. Mukashi, mukashi, kamisama ga imashita. Oh, 
Okay, and we're back, and we're talking tonight about Horus, Prince of the Sun, the 1968 Toei animated classic. Um, how should we jump in with this, guys? Do we want to talk about the background, or our reactions, or how, how, are we, how are we feeling tonight? Well, I guess let's just start from, well, you're, you were sort of the progenitor of us wanting to do this episode, so what inspired you to want us to talk about this movie? Um, so maybe about a year, year and a half ago, I suddenly developed some random interest in watching old anime films, and specifically the old Toei films of the 60s and 70s, and, uh, that led me in one direction to this and to the other. I also saw Flying Ghost Ship, which, um, Austin, uh, you, I forced you to watch that with me. That was an hour of your life. You're not getting back. It's the um, greatest film of all time. The, it, it, absolute Kino. Um, but <laughs> Horus, Horus was one that uh, a YouTuber that I enjoy, Stephen, that is like Stephen with an M and seven N, uh, he had done two videos about it, and it just sort of beguiled me into watching it. And I, I think it's not only historically important as as an anime film, but also it's just it's a very visually striking, interesting entry into the Toei canon, and uh, one thing that really kind of got to me is it reminds me a lot of, like, a Zelda game. It really does feel like if Zelda were in a Norse setting instead of the sort of pseudo-English uh, setting that it has, and that's kind of the thing, and I was like, wow, this is a great-looking movie, I should watch it, and then force everyone else to watch it and talk about it on the podcast, so that's really where this came from. Why don't we explain kind of what the plot of Horus Prince of the Sun is? I think maybe before that we should sort of explain where this movie came from. Like, who who the heck was behind actually making this? Because this could probably uh, provide our audience with uh, some through lines to connect it to things that they've probably already seen. And you know, right. maybe before that we should talk a little bit about what animation is and how <laughs> you take these pictures and you make the pictures move. Give and maybe we should context. talk about what pictures are and, and how they come to being. And <laughs> so, what, what is thought? <laughs> <laughs> so, so this film is directed by Isao Takahata, who we lost uh, a few years ago. Uh, one of the greatest anime, you know, figures of all time, basically, uh, director, producer, uh, just. If you don't know who he is, well, you're going to learn about it tonight by gum. Um, and this was his directorial debut, I believe. Um, although after this film bombed, he actually never directed for Toei again. They're like, We're, you're poison to us. Um, so this was kind of a, uh, a a passion project for him and, and Hayao Miyazaki, who I'm sure if you're listening to an anime podcast, you know who that is. Uh, this is their pre-Ghibli work. Uh, they were working for Toei, which was really trying to position itself as the Disney of the East, and the, the, the sort of the big wigs at Toei were like, we want to produce two anime films per year, which uh, nearly killed them. And this film was based on an Ainu legend. If you know about the Ainu, the, the indigenous people of Japan, they mostly live in the north of Japan now. Um, th there was a story adapted from a traditional Ainu tale written by Kazuo Fukazawa, um, and he turned it into a puppet play, and this really kind of hit Takahata, and he was like, I want to do this story as an animated feature film. And the reason that it's uh, not about the Ainu, actually, is because the, the people at Toei were like, we don't think that the Ainu are going to be a, a big selling point overseas, and also, without getting too much into the, the social history of Japan, uh, it, it would have been a very touchy subject for Japanese audiences, period. Although this film does have a lot of undertones that probably uh, went under the radar in that time period as well. Um, so they decided we're going to change this to a Scandinavian, Viking, Norse, sort of vaguely Norwegian setting. Um, uh, emphasis on the vague. Because very nothing vague. Ab nothing about it really screams Scandinavia, per se. Yeah, Other than, isn't... like, the character's name, which even you alluded to is not very, you know, Scandinavian at all. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is not Vinland Saga. This is very much <laughs> sort of, uh... And, and pe commentators have pointed out, like, if you look at the clothing of the characters, it's very much, like, taking the, the Ainu setting they wanted to do and just sort of putting a Norse gloss over it to kind of, uh... It's a very high fantasy fairy tale version of, of yeah. the Great North, rather than, like, a historical... 
uh, picture of what it would have been like. And, and you mentioned uh, that I knew history, and it's funny that you know, we live in a world now where Golden Kamui is this sort of this uh, this modern classic now, where uh, you know, it very much focuses on I knew culture and I knew language. So watching the movie myself, uh, you know, you see a lot of the clothing and these, these this culture that does remind me a lot of watching the you know, seeing that culture rather in Golden Kamui. Mm-hmm. And it's. It's honestly a miracle that this movie even exists because they, if you watch this film, and we'll probably get into it, there's many scenes that are basically just still shots and and pan and scans, and the reason why is because they basically were like, okay, we're not really liking what you're doing here, we're going to cut your budget, cut your time, and this film was basically the the little movie that could in many respects because it was really fighting against both the internal time and talent pressures of we have to design, animate, storyboard, just make this film happen, and then Toei itself going, we're not really feeling this anymore, we're not liking what you're doing with this, and we're going to put even more constraints on you. And uh, Takahata seems a little more kinder to it, but, but... Miyazaki himself has always said, no, this was, this was a young man's project. This was something that was, you know, me and, and Takahata being foolish and kind of, you know, being a little too idealistic about the animation industry. And with all that being said, it's also absolutely beautiful in that, like, the fighting the giant pike, the fish. Like, that's considered, like, a, a, a high watermark, a benchmark for for animation of that time period the characters are more complex uh, mark schilling who was a, a an animation film critic went to see this film and the jungle book and he said that horus won out over disney not necessarily because of its animation prowess but because it was telling a deeper more human and more contemporary story in many aspects because you cannot watch the film and not kind of see some of the animators more left-wing socialist uh community-based ideals kind of shine through in the film which is very much about uh coming together uniting as one uh the sort of redemptive quality as of, of coming together and and bringing people again as a group and I think that's partially another thing that makes it sort of an important part of animation history is it's it's not just let's tell a fun story for kids. It's this is something we're doing for the art that we want that we have a deeper message beyond the simplistic surface level morals of this sort of fairy tale story we're telling. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the thing that allows to stand the test of time because many people you'll read reviews and they say it, the animation is not quite up to snuff in all the areas it should be, or it's it's not. You know, the most engaging plot. It's a very short film. It's only like an hour and some change, if that. But I think if you look at it through a historical perspective, and if you look a little more below the surface, you're going to see um, a film that deserves to be in the canon of anime film for for a very good and a very important reason. So I guess let's kind of set the stage of like what the narrative of the film is about. I can do that if you want me to. Oh, or I can do that. Who, who, who should do this? I mean, if you want to, but I feel like you've you've already said a lot, so I don't okay. want to waste. You guys should fight. You, you guys should fight for yeah. the privilege, <laughs> or flip a coin for it. <laughs> okay, how about this? I did say a lot. Austin, you go ahead. Okay, cool. So I guess just to kind of set the stage for the mm-hmm. the uh, the in world narrative of uh, Horus Prince of the Sun. So you've got this. Uh, the movie starts. You see this uh, young boy fighting off these wolves in a fairly realistic, fairly violent way for a for a animated children's feature film <laughs> in uh, the late '60s. Um, it, it's this fairly realistic like battle that he's having with these wild wolves, and then uh, he fights them off, and then. He encounters this uh, big uh, rock man named Rockor. He's like this huge, like, per, uh, talking mountain, essentially. And uh, he meets him, and he says something, something, and then he uh, pulls a sword out of his shoulder. And he says that if you can, what was it? Like, if you can find a way to forge this sword, you will become the Prince of the Sun, or something like that. Um, and yep. then our, our titular character, Horus, uh, learns. Um, from his uh, dying father, that uh, this uh, evil wizard man named uh, Grunwald is like uh, turning the land to darkness, and uh, Horus is the hero that can save save the world from this uh, horrible pointed demon man. And then 
Uh, he visits its village and encounters this girl, and then the narrative springs forth from there. So it's it is it is a grand sort of mythic sty- uh, type uh, adventure, and I think. Um, one thing that it reminded me a lot of whenever I was watching it is not so much like an adventure in the sense of like, uh, let's say like Peter Pan um, to give sort of the, the Disney analog. Uh, it feels more of a venture of like an adventure akin to like uh, Lord of the Rings where there's like a lot of uh, high fantasy, a lot of like world context um, weaved through the film a lot of characters that have like a moral grayness about them that are not necessarily black or white and a lot of those elements are what sort of made this <coughs> film so revolutionary for the time and to what made you know Takahata and Miyazaki both sort of uh, very progressive very forward thinking uh, creators for this time period because a lot of the other Toei films Sully, correct me if I'm wrong, we're very much in the Disney mold where it's going to be a very simple adventure, the bad guys are going to be bad, the good guys are going to be good, there's going to be some musical numbers, and we're just going to call it a day. Um, But this film has a lot more complexity to it. Um, I don't think it necessarily succeeds in every regard or or holds up in every single context, but the fact that they were trying these things in 1968 is uh, sort of it, it sets the stage for what like films like Nausicaa and Princess Mononoke and things would eventually become uh, much later on. And you, it's interesting you mentioned Nausicaa because uh, that is in many regards considered sort of the the if Horus it was a rough draft for that. Uh, Miyazaki has said something similar in, a, in, a, in at least in effect to that himself. Um, and there's also this idea of. Toei trying to leave the shadow of Disney, because even though there are some very Disney-feeling moments in this film, I think this is the one where we start to see Toei divorce itself. It is positioning itself as the Disney of the East, but that's not to say we are just doing Japanese Disney. We are doing something that is very much of our own style, and this is... Um, I, I'm trying to think where, like, Puss in Boots falls in this timeline off the top of my head, whether this is before or after, but if it's before, and I, and I think it is, I believe it is, uh, we're leaving the fairy tale mold, and it, we're still staying in the, the world of high fantasy, but like you said, this is more of like a Beowulf story rather than a Cinderella or, uh, or a, a Puss in Boots even. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's it's Beowulf if there's like you know a catchy tune and some talking bears and stuff like that. Yes, we still have we still have the talking animals. We still have the the cutesy scenes of people sort of going about and doing work in cute ways. We still have a, a villain who's in sort of the more classic Disney villain vein, who's you know completely evil and is just a domineering force in the film. We don't really have the sort of sassy modern or, or like not a, he's not a captain hulk or an ursula or a cruella he's very much a maleficent and evil queen type he looks like if uh tetsujin 28 wanted to cosplay as maleficent that grunwald <laughs> as a character is is interesting but his design is one of the worst in the film it is so much like if you were to tell like a 10 year old it's like draw a bad guy that's what would come <laughs> out of that that conversation Tell a two-year-old um, to draw Batman from memory. I mean, yeah, he really does seem like, you know, get get Tetsujin 28 and to cosplay <laughs> Maleficent, but he's like, I changed my mind, I want to be Batman last minute before I go to the party. <laughs> and there's Grunewald. Um, and then you have a character like Hilda who is, her design is very simple, but they animate her in such a, a, a vivid, lush way that she really does feel... Uh, to be a fully realized character, or even Horace, who is maybe a, a little more simpler than Hilda, but still is very well animated. And then you have the children who are... The little boy is ugly, and the little girl is like, she's so adorably ugly. Like, I want a doll of the little girl, because she's <laughs> she's not quite proportioned right, but there's something about her. I'm just like, God, I, I don't want you to get hurt in this movie. Please live, you strange, <laughs> ugly little creature. <laughs> <laughs> Oh! 
think my favorite part of this movie or my favorite aspect of the movie is the story arc with Hilda because out of everyone in the movie she has the most complex narrative because she's torn between what she's been told uh, by Grunewald of just you need to wear this necklace or if you take it off you'll die and this yearning to be with the village and to uh, be with Horace but also this fear of well is this the right decision and do I really fit in and just kind of that distance that she kind of keeps from the village um, and just seeing her character arc as she progresses of just like struggling with uh, with that choice and uh, dealing with dealing with the consequences of the ch- of the choice she makes um, towards the end of the movie and I think she's probably one of the most complex female anime characters we've had up until this point in in, in anime history um, she is not only being, I mean, spoiler, but she's not only being lied to by Grunewald, who is her brother, this, this sort of, you know, manipulating her, but she also has these sort of complex inner feelings of, of wanting to belong, of feeling used, of feeling conflicted over the choices she feels like she has to make or the choices she's being forced to make. And it's really, again, to, compared to Disney, when you have characters like, uh, this is 1968, so so far we've had like Snow White, Alice, and Cinderella. They're very much uh, kind of one note out of those. Maybe Alice is the most complex, and even then it's just in more of an exploratory way. And then you have, you know, someone like Hilda, who is this, you know, in a way tortured character. She's very much uh, the emotional core of the film. She does not have as much screen time as as as. Horus or Hulse or however want to however want to call him, but she is sort of the mm. the thing that keeps us the audience emotionally engaged in the story because otherwise it is just Horus performing these Beowulf like tasks, we're, we're, fighting the wolves, fighting the fish, uh, dealing with the vis- villagers, running around with that sword that's obviously way too big for his tiny <laughs> body. Yeah, where Horus is basically on the on the hero's journey, if you think about it, of him being with his family, but then that gets um, gone away where he is sent out on the quest to get back with his people, mm-hmm. according to his father. Um, so it's it's where he's telling a, a story that we've seen over and over again, and you kind of know the beats of um, Hilda, in contrast, is a bit more complex. And I so think Tobias, it's a- you've been kind of quiet, so w- what are your thoughts on this movie? <clears throat> so... I, I was kind of hesitant going into this movie at first. You know, I, I'm no stranger to, to older anime for sure, but uh, as a child of the 90s, that that aesthetic is kind of my limit for what I've usually been able to enjoy. And I don't want to be the guy that's like, well, the art style just looks old. It doesn't look good. Was, uh, I think that's kind of hogwash in general. <clears throat> but uh, I, I was hesitant to kind of jump into this because I've seen, like, some previews of, of of this movie and other early Toei movies, and I've just they've never really like mm. like got me. But uh, see, even sitting down to this, and you mentioned earlier in that initial scene that it's just him straight up uh, killing wolves right off the bat. There's no intro or anything. Uh, it just hooked me from the very first scene, and there's something that just feels very timeless and classic about these character designs for instance that's something that i've noticed pretty early on is that yeah the the designs and the general aesthetic do look you know old but they do hold up in a lot of ways and uh just looking at that initial fight scene where he's throwing that axe around with the rope on it Mm. is very very interesting when you look at a lot of what maybe cartoons are doing at the time very basic fight choreography very simple you know animation uh but when you look at like a lot of the camera angles they've set up even just the way they framed these shots uh really make this movie stand out i feel like and a lot of these scenes it definitely i can see why this would be one of the earliest examples of of a uh, you know stand standout works in the anime canon well it um at the time it was the biggest budget for a movie because it ballooned because they went over time it took them 
two years to make this movie compared to yeah. uh, Toei Animation's uh, one year policy that they were implementing. Yeah. And usually, and, this is according to the Mike Tool commentary, they would spend usually around 75 to 85 million yen on a, on a movie where this movie ballooned to, I think, 175 million yen. Okay. Oh, it's over double there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just kind of backtrack a little to what we were talking about with uh, Hilda specifically. Uh, and when she gets introduced, I was kind of expecting a very, very tropey, generic plot line with her. And it, I mean, it does kind of go that way, but I felt like she kind of fascinated me as a character just because of how haunting her design uh, and her her arc was through the movie. Just the way that she we, she's introduced in the music. And the way that she has that very hypnotic effect on the people in the village, uh, mm-hmm. I thought that was executed very well. Did uh, anybody else have thoughts on that specifically? Yeah, I mean, the way that she's introduced is very ethereal. You you kind of don't mm-hmm. trust her as an yeah. audience member right off, uh, even though Horace and sort of his uh, naivety is just like very interested in like, Ooh, who's this weird girl that the town doesn't like for some weird reason, though she's nice to me. Um yeah she she does come off as kind of creepy and i i didn't whenever i was first watching the movie because i didn't know anything about it i was like i i is is this is this girl supposed to be creepy or am i just thinking she's creepy because of the way she was designed and it's just kind of dated um but you know in hindsight it's like that that does add a real uh good piece of uh uh non-verbal storytelling uh, especially to her she definitely stands out when you compare her to the other characters because you have uh, Horace and the other sort of village children who have these very round, colorful designs. You have the village elders who are very much in the sort of like stock cartoon, you know, arsenal of oh, old man, old woman, tall man, mm-hmm. short man. And then you have Hilda who um, she's animated in such a fluid, very subtle way and, and her colors and her her overall design stands out so much more from the rest of the villagers and then you sadly have Grunwald who has the very plain uh, not very complicated or very visually striking design and I guess uh, she kind of has the you know she does have that sort of halfway between dark and light design that really does help hint at her being affiliated with him in some way uh, probably to his detriment because again his design is so lackluster that she um kind of feels much like it, you would almost expect her to be the big villain at the end because she has so much more care taken into her um but i think that compared to even now some of the the anime heroines that we get she is still sort of a standout i mean i'm not saying that we have made no progress in the in the 50 ish years since this film uh, debuted but I do feel like she still te- stands the test of time to other characters, even as simple as her motivations might be. They are still motivations that are that carry weight in the narrative of her own world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they're complex and they're weighty. But I do want to just give a caveat about this movie, like overall, like if we're describing it in this way and it sounds really interesting to you guys and you guys are fans of Ghibli anyway, I don't think that 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 necessarily in of itself means that you will necessarily like this movie because it certainly does feel like a movie from 1968, even though it was kind of forward thinking for its time. Yeah, Yeah, this is definitely a movie for people who um, enjoy older animation, which I I do. I actually, one of the things that made me want to watch this film was I thought it looked incredibly charming but I also grew up right. watching older cartoons on VHS and stuff so mm-hmm. if you're okay with that or if you're more into a historical perspective in anime I say try it but if you're looking for something uh, I mean it could be kind of a popcorn movie it's not this is, this is not as heady and uh, sort of you know, this is not like trying to make something like The Lord of the Rings. This is still making a children's film, but I think it's important to look at it um, as a very well-made, very mature children's film. And if you're able to watch it in that regard, I say go for it. Oh, also, I'm sorry, it's, it's bugs me. I wouldn't compare this movie to Lord of the Rings because Lord of the Rings is more a uh, Wood War type story. I think this is more in the style of kind of the Brothers Grimm fairy tales. Well, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of what Disney was doing back then with the, a lot of the original stuff was just taking these classic stories 
Okay, giving it the old, you know, Disney approach. And so it's kind of the same way here, just with this I knew story that uh, that itself is classic all throughout, but it's not something that has particularly been told before. I guess yeah. the reason why I connected it to Lord of the Rings is because that one character stood out to me so much as being like like that one character in Lord of the Rings who was like always who was like Saruman's uh, spy in the town. Oh, the oh. owl. No, not the owl. No, the guy. The, 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 the oh, mayor, the mayor. The oh, guy. yes. Yeah, yeah. And he was like always trying to get people to, uh, you know, in subtle in subtle ways, he was trying to w- rile up the uh, the um, the townspeople like against Horus and like against you know whatever, so that Grunwald yeah. could you know sweep in and get his dastardly deeds done. I mean, I, I do love see a lot owl, of Disney's though. approach here, and in, in that sense, uh, the, the the story feels very classic overall. These character archetypes, whether it's you know the, the whether it's the big bad Grunwald or you know like you mentioned that Wormtongue character, that the the, the 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 young hero, uh, it feels very Disney in that regard. But rather than having you know a freaking song every five minutes, you know, <laughs> Disney loves to do. Uh, they they stick with a, a like you said a more mature storytelling uh, overall like sure you got the cute animal mascot characters uh, but to sort of go back you mentioned the, the 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 fight with the fish and the fight with the wolves in the beginning uh, it definitely feels a little more iconic than I think uh, a, a kind of a kid story would. This kind uh, of film, like, particular scenes, especially. This kind yeah. of feels like a film that Disney might have made uh, before they kind of got locked into that family entertainment. And this feels like something that could have followed up. Like if this were made in America, this is, feels like it could follow up Snow White potentially. Um, yeah. Either that, that or be beauty. something, or e- Pinocchio. Or, well, yeah. I'd say either that, but it, like the film. I don't know. It's like if we're making the comparison to Disney, I see this film more and don't I don't necessarily mean this is a bad thing. I see this as something more akin to like the Black Cauldron, uh, where yes. where I, like I see Hor- what you're going for Horus Prince of the Sun doesn't really feel like it fits with Puss in Boots or uh, Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid and stuff like that, and it also doesn't really feel like it fits with Nausicaa either. Um, so it's kind of like this weird middle movie mm-hmm. that doesn't really have any direct well, peers i mean there's probably other stuff out there like it i mean um flying phantom ship is like kind of similar even though that movie mm-hmm. is like you know way more As modern <laughs> i guess well, and just like weird and horace is like not weird i mean it's got some weirdness in it but it's it's overall pretty straightforward but but i see it where just you're seems going. like in yeah, the, it, it has that sort of limited. Uh, the animation's a little more limited. The designs kind of match up with Flying Ghost Ship a little bit. The sort of yeah. uh, it feel they feel very much like contemporaneous with each. I mean, they are, but they feel like they're very much in that similar mindset. But Flying Phantom Ship or Flying Ghost Ship is a uh, very much very campy, and you cannot watch it as a serious film. Uh, it's it ha- its redeeming qualities are in how ridiculous it is, and Horus is like for its faults, and it has many. It still rises above that, which is what makes it uh, something worth discussing. Mm-hmm. Would you think- uh, would would you guys possibly agree then that this movie, uh, kind of alongside uh, Tezka's character design and manga work, would you maybe agree that this is kind of an intermediary period where? Uh, these Japanese artists are seeing what Disney's doing and trying to adapt it not only in their country but also their cultural uh, mindset? I would say that because yeah, probably. me and Austin were having this discussion today when we met up with each other before recording. Um, the talking animals are such an interesting touch because people uh, sort of parody Disney for the talking animals. But if you watch the early Disney movies, the animals either exclusively talk on one another, uh, amongst one another, so they must have some sort of animal language that we aren't privy to, or uh, they're magical. Like they're they're kind of they're there, but they don't operate in the sort of like all the animals talk. Or it's like a movie where it's like Alice in Wonderland, where they're just talking animals because of the the location of Wonderland. Um, but then here you have it where Horace talks to a bear and it's, there's no like, oh, this is a magic bear or this is like some sort of, you know, guide or folkloric character. Uh, it's very much in that vein of, oh, the animals talk, which is a very Grimm's thing and not a Disney thing. Like Disney is 
more that the talking animals are a whimsical touch and in, in, in the original folklore the animals are these sort of representations or these sort of guides uh, and they're kind of in this middle ground because even though the bear is talking to Horace like you know when Little Red Riding Hood walks into the woods and the wolf talks there he's also very cutesy and he's just there to be the mascot character and so it's sort of this uh, this sort of aping you know not to make too much of a pun of Disney without quite uh, getting all of the mechanics of it and that's not to say it's lesser or that it's inferior it's just saying that this is Toei understanding the Disney uh, touch the, the sort of uh, iconography the talking animal the songs and then either not doing it exactly in a Disney way because they can't copy them or doing their own take on it I think of the songs too like you have the opening song which is just you know Horace's theme you have Hilda's song and then you end I think with another chorus of Horace's theme and that works for this movie because Hilda's song is very haunting and it, it serves to, to to further the narrative it's not like you know, oh, Snow White, which, you know, is a beautifully animated movie. It's gorgeous to look at, but it is boring to watch. I tried to watch that movie a few years ago, and I was like, God, it's just people in depression were just willing to watch anything. Just, okay, some birds <laughs> doing laundry for 20 damn minutes. Okay, I get it. It's cute. Move on. <laughs> but you never feel that with Horace. I mean, my problems with Horace mm -hmm. are like the scene with, there's a scene with the villagers about to, to you know, rouse arms and it's all static shots because they were just like we don't have the money or the time Toei is you know, bearing down on us so we have to just use this that we have and that's not so much a flaw of the film as it is a flaw in the, the history of the film trying to be realized I don't know if it was a time constraint or if it was money because according to the commentary I listened to it might have been an artistic choice done by Takahata I mean, and that's possible too. We could, we would only be able to know if we, if there are any existing interviews with him to discuss it, or anyone else with the staff, which I tried to find, but I was not exactly as. Ex I, there's a lot of great information about this film, but not as in depth as I maybe would have wished I could find. And I unfortunately did not listen to either of the commentary tracks when watching this film, hmm. which is surprising because I usually um, do. <laughs> even if those still frames, like in the action scenes, um, were you know specific artistic choices they still stand in sort of like a strange contrast to some of the more you know fully animated battle scenes like especially the one in the beginning like the the movie sort of hits you right off the top of the head with a like very i mean it's it's kind of sloppy by today's standards but like a very well realized like battle scene like a fully animated battle scene like right off the bat and then the same with the fish thing and i think that the like the mammoth fight later on towards the end is also pretty like with fluidly that, animated yeah. With the ice giant. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, even if it was an artistic choice, it's, like, a strange one. Uh, but Because it, it just stands in such stark contrast to the other stuff in the same film. So, who knows? And even though the, the wolf fight is, is very rough in terms of its animation, I mean, you can kind of tell that it was a little... Uh, shaky in places it's still so visceral like you like it's hard not to watch that scene and then feel the the strikes that Horace is giving to the to the wolves like it's very uh vi and again this was a children's this is very much so marketed to small children and uh I, I could not see Disney in 68 again they were putting out the oh, Jungle yeah. Book Absolutely. contemporary mm -hmm. contemporaneously mm -hmm. to this film they would not have done that and I think that's another thing. It sort of does not talk down to its audience. It doesn't talk down to either the adults or the children. It says this is the story we are telling, and we are telling it in simplistic terms, perhaps, but we're we're using the the sort of the language and the the feeling of a folk tale, of a fairy tale, to get the story across to you. So this will not be a complex human drama, but the the feelings and the emotions themselves are complex. Mm. And I think um, that's probably why it resonated with like people of Takahata and Miyazaki's age bracket at the time, you know, like uh, mm. students and uh, especially people with their, with similar political um, pro, uh, what's the word, um, proclivities uh, at that time period. I mean, if you watch this film, the the village is, is this unifying force for good and things that are bad, Grunwald, uh, Wormtongue, um, the owl, I love the owl, I'm sorry. 
Um, <laughs> their 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 main force of evil, like even though Grunwald has his sort of magical forces and he has his wolves and all that, his, his main attack seems to be to sow discord and disbelief. And, and conspiracy among the villagers. There's this idea of something powerful is seeking to disenfranchise ourselves from each other, and that is the villain. And then with Hilda, I think of the scene where the women are sewing the wedding dress together, and they invite her, and they, they sort of welcome her into their fold, and Hilda's sort of rejection and discomfort with that is sort of the thing that says the, the, the theme of this film is coming together, and, and that is so in line with the sort of the student protests, the socialist undercurrents of Japan in this time period. This we are unhappy because we feel we are not being we are not unified or unified in the ways that we should be. And this film is very much saying that very loudly. I mean, in, in our current political climate. Um, I think it resonates again to us, like distance by country and time. We still can understand the idea of like we can come together and we can fight the the demon king who is trying to sow discord <laughs> among us. Or we can I we mean... can, or we can face even things like the pike. We can face natural disasters. So there's also this respect for nature in terms of ideas of the the pike the wolves this you know they the wolves are agents of grunwald but the pike isn't it's just a problem that they're facing and it's affecting their environment they can no longer fish they can they're no longer getting water because it's damming up the river um there's a lot going on in this movie again for a children's movie that is not so heavily cloaked in metaphor you can't see it but it is definitely something that's like we're trying to get you to think about the story on a deeper level we're trying to introduce you to engaging with this animated feature in a way that perhaps an other uh, one other films that Toei would have made is not trying to do i mean puss in boots wasn't asking you to think about you know collectivism in in society <laughs> I mean, uh, if somebody asked me to draw late stage capitalism, I'm not saying it wouldn't look exactly like Grunwald. <laughs> Tobias, uh, with your love of surrealism and psychedelic, uh, psychedelic visuals, I thought you would have enjoyed um, uh, the kind of the surrealism imagery that is in uh, Horace Prince of the Sun. Like, oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, later in the movie, I think in the uh, in that final climax, we see a lot of that. Uh, or, yeah, with, like, like the stuff with um, the scene where Hilda's by herself. Uh, and you see uh, just her in that kind of this blizzard, or kind of the the kind of the ice snow wolf yeah. ghosts. Yeah, the snow. That's right. Yeah, no, I d d definitely enjoyed that part as well. I, I feel like a lot of this holds up. And just to backtrack a little, you know, I, I feel like these designs are both classic and dated to some degree. Uh, not mm. in the, necessarily in a bad way, but they definitely look like something made in the '60s. But uh, I do think a lot of the animation quality itself, like the actual animation, while sure doesn't hold up to uh, you know wacky Sakuga fest that you know that, that we we enjoy now, uh, I still think it holds up really well and it looks pretty good. Uh, like mm. we mentioned, the like a lot of the fight scenes do uh, they do feel impactful. Uh, they can be maybe not uh, very realistic a lot of times, a little cartoony for sure, but. Uh, like I said, that really did hook hook, hook me from the the move the moment the movie started, and uh, you know kept uh, kept me going throughout the end of it. This was recently actually screened in 2018 at a children's film festival, so I it must hold up to some degree if it's you know considered worth showing. And this was an American film festival as well, so I mean it must be. You know, it, it has merit, and I feel like that's the thing I'm constantly trying to tell people when I talk about this movie is it has a lot of merit if you can get past some of the, the, the sort of roughshod qualities and some of the fact that, like, again, not everyone is sort of prepared to engage with older animation. If you can get past that, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous movie, and it's definitely worth watching. So, uh, so if you have a problem with the animation in the movie, go watch a few episodes of Charge Man Ken... 
<laughs> come back and you will enjoy Horus that much more. <laughs> Charge Man Ken is the real prince of my son. <laughs> because, I mean, not to say that older stuff is bad or anything. I, I mean, there certainly has merit. I don't want to make that comparison at all. But uh, I, it did surprise me as someone that, you know, kind of has a limit for how far back I can go and still enjoy it to the same degree. Uh, how much it did hold up uh, visually it, it still looks really good and I, you know I don't know why my brain keeps going back to this but the more I, I see the stuff in Horus it makes me think of for some reason like the Legend of Zelda I mean I don't that's, know if it's just so let me I, let me give some background yeah. to that. Uh, so Shigeru Miyamoto loves Toei films. He grew up watching mm. them. Uh, if you read interviews with him, he talks very frequently about how Toei films like Bowser, Koopa, is based on the, the Ox King from Toei's version of Journey to the West, which was Alakazam the Great here. Right. Um, the, the, the art style of The Wind Waker was based on Little Prince and the Eight-Headed mm. Dragon, uh, if you look at the hero in that movie, he literally just looks like Wind Waker Link in a different costume. So I, I really think there is a connection between Horus and Zelda. If I were going to give a panel about the history of the Zelda franchise, I would feel remiss if I did not mention um, Horus as a possible inspiration. I mean, even the name Hilda, uh, and later the character of Hilda in A Link Between Worlds, I think that there's not... I mean, he did base Zelda off of Zelda Fitzgerald's name, but I don't think right. it would be impossible to say there is a through line here. And this movie was, it bombed when it came out in Japan. It, it only was in the theater for 10 days before Toei yanked it. But it was still well received by children, and it sort of became a, one of those situations where future generations respected it more. And I, I think that... Miyamoto, very possibly, I could say that with a little bit of confidence, might have been at least aware enough of this film to take some ideas from it. I mean, Horus is very much in the vein of the Famicom era Link, the, the young boy who journeys out and, and is willing to fight for the people. And then you have the more complex princess character, because I feel like Hilda is definitely more in the vein of a Zelda character than, you know, a Princess Peach. Uh, for sure, and, and the <laughs> fact that music is such a big deal you know, in this, and, you know, even from that first scene, you know, with, with the main character facing off against this wolf pack, and then suddenly this big rock man shows up, that is, like, that is exactly a thing that would happen to you in Breath of the Wild. <laughs> it, it is! It is and true. Exactly. And I don't know what it is about, like, the, the big rock man, what was it, like, a, a rock or was his name? Maug. Uh, in the, yeah, Ma it's, Ma yeah, it's Maug in uh, the Japanese version, but in the English dub, they, his name is Rockor. Rockor. <laughs> Rockor. But between that and, like, the big fish, uh, again, not to say that you know, Zelda did it or anything, but it just it felt very familiar to me as someone that enjoys those, those video games. I mean, uh, like I said, that's the entire reason I watched this film. I was like, oh, it makes me think of a Zelda game. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, and, and I then again, there's something classic about that type of story that you know this bleeds through in the visuals. And there is uh, this so. sort of Triforce style relationship between Grunwald, Hilda, and Horus that is kind of you know you know even though Zelda and Ganondorf are not like siblings, there is this sort of we are connected to each other by this this force. And in the in the film, it is you know Horus is sort of predestined to be the hero of this these people. Hilda is connected to Grunwald, and Grunwald is the 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 blight upon this community. They do kind of like Horus. I mean, Grunwald is basically just. Poor Poorly drawn Ganondorf, basically. <laughs> he's just like he's not even the pig Ganon. He's just like he's like like stickman Ganon, basically. <laughs> So we've talked a lot about the background of this film, our reactions to this film. Uh, do we want to talk a bit about the cast? Because there, there's some interesting things to uncover there. I will say one quick note before that. In addition to uh, 
Maug, also being called Rakor. In some versions, he is also called Boldo. That if that is any Zelda name, it is Boldo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he sounds like he's going to sell me some potions in his shop and probably charge me way too much. <laughs> so. Talking about the cast, I, I really just wanted to focus on Horace, Hilda, and Grunwald. So Horace is played by uh, Hisako Okata. She's actually still working. She's still alive. Uh, but she's kind of a bit player. She played Hannah in the Little Women anime from the 80s. Uh, she was Fumi Fukushima in Kamen Rider Ghost. And uh, there's this movie I found out called The Robin Girl from 2008. I think it might be an American movie about some... American woman who moves to Japan to become a ramen expert. It, I don't know. I just looked interesting on her on her resume, and she was uh, Maizumi's mother in that. I don't know how big a role that is. I was just like, I gotta talk about this because it, it it has to be real. I can't just have been like having a fever dream when I was working <laughs> on these show notes. Um, and then we have Hilda, who is Etsuko Ichihara. Uh, she actually died in January of this year. We lost her uh, very recently. Uh, she's had over one number of film credits to her name. She's a very long-running Japanese actress. Uh, if you went to my film panel, my Japanese film panel, Animazement, you heard me sing the praises of the 2015 movie Sweet Bean. Uh, she was Yoshiko in that. She was the friend of Tokue, the older woman. Um, so you can see her in that. She was also uh, Hitoha Miyamizu Mia in Your Name. She's the grandmother of the girl. Oh. So she's in that she, okay. again, a, a bit, a bit part. Um, I recently began watching Face of Another, like I said, and she's the yo-yo girl in that. It's a very brief role, but when he goes to to book the or to rent the apartment, the girl playing yo-yo outside, that's her. And also, she was Helena Cyborg 0010 in Cyborg 009 in the Monster Wars. Uh, oh. So you know, kind of, kind of interesting. And then we get the Grunwald, who is Miki Jirohira. He is considered the finest Shakespearean actor in Japan. He was a very long-running <laughs> stage presence. And in his older years, he started doing uh, TV, film, voice work. Um, it, again, in face of another, he has a much larger role. He is basically the second main character. He is the psychiatrist that, that performs the surgery. I don't know why a psychiatrist is doing facial surgery in this movie, but just <laughs> go with it. But he is one of the main male actors in Face of Another, which I highly recommend and will be featured in my panel at Aowa. He is uh, Yasumasa Hirai in Tokyo the, Ma the Last Megapolis, which is another movie you guys have to watch with me. It's very long and very weird, and uh, M. Bison from Street Fighter was inspired by it, so that's a thing. Um, he was also Sinno, Sinno Ryukyu, Rikyu in Goemon. I'm taking Japanese and I can't even read Romaji. Um, <laughs> so, again, these are very sort of bit parts in, or, or roles that maybe other anime fans are not aware of or, or consume a lot. I kind of, again, recognized um, Ichihara and Hira from their, from their movie roles that they were been in, but... I just thought it was important to highlight it, and the fact that Horace's voice actor, Okada-san, she's still working. She's been doing um, little bit roles in anime for quite a while, but none that really stood out to me. Um, so that's the cast, and they they worked, and they still had been working up oh. until the time that this, you know, most of them passed away. The only one still alive is, is Okada-san. It, it also shows a difference of uh, anime production because a lot of these people were film actors or probably stage actors as well, whereas today uh, you have the seiyu who kind of rises up to prominence to get big roles in big anime productions. Yeah, that's a, a shift in animation across the a world, basically, um, because, you know, even like... Okay, Little Mermaid came out in 89, the, the American version. You know, they were not, like, well-known, like, celebrity voice actors. These were, like, stage actors or career voice actors, which was very common uh, across the board in animation until uh, basically things like Aladdin or... I mean, Lindsay Ellis has a very fascinating video on that, but we really go from you know, people who are professionally trained to do voice work, and that's very similar to stage work because you have to do a lot more acting with your voice on stage as opposed to in camera, so you have those kind of worlds doing it, and then we have this shift now to getting the celebrity voice cast, which I I personally feel like 
that's not how I think animated movies should be made, but that's my soapbox. I'm not going to get on the day. I will say, as poorly as Grunewald is designed, uh, Mikishiro Hira does a wonderful job in voicing him. He has a great, evil, Ganondorf-esque voice. Oh, Horus, oh, join me. Like, it's very, uh, it's, it's... It's, you know, in the vein of a cartoon villain, but you can tell he was a, a traditionally Shakespearean uh, stage actor doing this. You know, just enough restraint to not be mm. ridiculous with that terrible, <laughs> terrible... If you wanted to cosplay Grunwald, oh, you would need just some cardboard, Please. some cardboard, some toilet paper tubes, <laughs> and, and a bit of fake fur, and you'd be said, this is not, Man. this is a $50 cosplay, if that. Man, I would Go, pay to see that at a con. <laughs> <laughs> you should bring it like a little stuffed like beanie baby wolf too and throw them at people I, I, join me <laughs> i'm tangent town children tangent yeah. town so uh so is that is that the final word from us on horace prince of the sun should we go into our uh, most iconic scenes i think talking about our favorite scene would be a would be a good way to end it sure well i'll go ahead and go first by saying my favorite scene, or at least the scene that uh, that will probably stand out to me the most, is probably just that one shot of whenever uh, Horace's dad on his deathbed is first telling him about uh, the horrific, you know, Overlord Grunwald, and you see that uh, that wonderful scene of like Grunwald like rising up over that town and like wiping his cape across the city, and it's like transparent. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just a great scene. And every time I think about this movie, I'll, I, I will probably think about that. Or just the opening song where Horace is running around with the sword straight up in the air, just, like, bolting it down those <laughs> The sword hills. that is, like, his height and some more. Like, it is a very yeah. large sword. He, is a, he is a little boy, and that is a big sword. Will she try out, kid? <laughs> I think for me, the scene, there are kind of two scenes. One, I mentioned before when Hilda goes to the women and they're, they're preparing the wedding dress and she sort of has this, like, this sort of, this conflict of, of self of, I want to belong, but I can't because my brother is an evil stick demon. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry, like, I, I do love this It's movie. the modern dilemma, really. It's the modern dilemma, and also the scene where she's with that ugly, ugly, adorably ugly child, um, and the little girl's <laughs> running around, and they're in the flower field, and then the owl swoops down and is like, you know that child will die. Like, I say that and it sounds funny, but I'm not saying it's a joke. Like, it's very dark and very discomforting, and it is, you know, I, I, I say I love the owl, but I do love this him as this sort of villainous consciousness, this aspect of, Gr of Grinwald coming to... To sort of remind Hill, it's like know your place. You're a bad. You're an evil person. You are. You are a danger to these people you're going to love, and that it's very eerie when he says, "You know the child will die, and you're going to be the cause of it." Now that's a very striking scene. It might not be. He's the, the devil in her ear, basically. Her squirrel. Her squirrel companion is basically her, like um, the kind of like her conscience is like, "No, you shouldn't do this." Her Jiminy it's, Cricket, basically. Yep. And it's basically. not like but, a. Yeah. It's not a sakuga scene, but it's it's very well animated and it's just very well acted, and I I think it's one of my favorites. Isn't there a scene where she like very humorously and suddenly thwacks the owl? Yes, yes, <laughs> that's kind of the opposite of that scene. It's a little. That's, uh... that's my third favorite scene, if not the <laughs> first. It's the... Yeah, it's so good. What about you guys, Bill and Tobias? What are your favorite scenes? Um, I'll let you go first. Okay. Uh. I wouldn't say this is my favorite scene, but I, this is probably my favorite bit of thing I heard from the commentary. After Horace defeats the fish, the village has a celebration where they open up the dam and get a bunch of fish, and they start having this kind of um, traditional folk dance in the middle of the village. Yeah. Uh, from what I heard on the commentary, um, they were um Oh, help me, Sully. Do, I'm having a brain fart right now. Who's the direct? What's the name of the director? Isao Takahata. Takahata. Thank you, to Isao Takahata, where he was drawing it from memory. Like, he had no reference uh, doing the folk dance. And so he went up to Miyazaki and said, hey, can you come out into the parking lot and we'll 
uh, we will do a folk dance so that way I can kind of get my reference down. So I like to imagine uh, Takahara and Miyazaki doing a traditional folk dance <laughs> in the parking lot. <laughs> That's dedication right there. Miyazaki gets done and immediately like chain smokes four packs of cigarettes out of embarrassment. <laughs> Austin, uh, Austin, to go back it's to your not, to not your not. mentioning the opening scene describing the backstory, I am reminded that reminded me so much of a night on Bald Mountain from Fantasia, the way they position Grunwald over the village. Um, yeah, he does kind of look like a discount like dollar store Chernabog. He's the Dollar Tree Chernabog, you know. That's if you can't. Uh, he's 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 Chernborg. <laughs> Chernborg, <laughs> draw uh, Chernborg from memory. <laughs> <laughs> it's Man. like when you see those figures, like yeah, in like the dollar, or the dollar store. It's like light. It's, it's not. It's not supposed to be a licensed character. It's like the name is slightly misspelled, and the colors are off. Grubald yes. is basically like Devil Man, but he's a scrawny nerd now. <laughs> <laughs> What happened to you, Akira? Chern- Chernobog before he started working out. I mean, that's what happens if you're not hitting that gym, devil man or not. That's <laughs> what oh, so happens if you skip leg day and every other day, too. Oh, my God. Go, Tobias. Please. That's the name of the episode. Don't skip leg day, devil <laughs> man. <laughs> so, uh, I want to mention two things. So, I've already talked a lot about the opening scene, and I do think it's really great. Uh, I, I think in most movies like this, we would be treated to a, you know, a musical number in the beginning. I guess the swell of the orchestra, as there's an opening song and the title, and then it's a very fantastical introduction to the setting. But rather than do that, which is the second scene, they just open up with this like, knockdown, drag out fight where this little boy is just kicking some wolves' ass just because he can, which just kind of stood out to me as a very interesting, uh, a very interesting opening. Uh, with his weird like things, hand axe, yeah, yeah, it was a very interesting weapon. Rope. Right? You know, you you think of something maybe more traditional in these kind of stories, just like a basic sword and shield, you I mean, just kind of swinging away. But the way they have this axe like arc around the wolves and sort of cut them down without making it too graphic, because this is a kids' movie after all. But uh, you know, seeing him go back and forth and these wolves attack him and he attacks them back was a very very interesting interestingly animated fight uh but i think the thing that stuck with me throughout the whole movie was less of a scene and more of a character uh i really liked koro the bear mm-hmm. uh, maybe it's just maybe it's just i haven't watched a, a, a like a kids disney movie in a while but there was something very just earnest about this uh this little bear character he has a very cute design that i liked it kind of like uh you know charmed me from the very first scene he showed up uh, maybe it's just because he's not singing and dancing like a lot of Disney stuff would be, but because he actually runs around like a bear does, just happens to have a very cartoonish face. Uh, I really, really liked Koro the Bear. That is the correct opinion. You don't like Flip or the Squirrel, who I don't uh, they were, remember they, they the were name great of. Too, but uh, I watched this movie like two weeks ago and just skipped through it right for the podcast. Uh, so they're not as fresh in my mind, but the 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 owl was great. The owl was great too. I want an evil yeah. white owl to follow me around. <laughs> <laughs> well, I oh. think that does it for Hulse, Prince of the Sun. Uh, I would like to thank my co-hosts Austin, Bill, and Tobias. Where could people find you if they really want to hear you talk about all the ways we can make fun of Brunwald's design? <laughs> <laughs> uh hey i'm austin you can find me over on twitter at bebop shock and that's uh bebop is in cowboy bebop and shock is in bioshock i need to replay those games it's about time yeah. <laughs> yeah. you got you got a lot of games to play <laughs> hey Not hey you know, I, do it. I know i know that more than anyone trust me <laughs> ape escape uh, 3 is calling my name <laughs> Uh, instead of doing plugs for me, I'm just going to get one last word in and say um, Discotech put out uh, Horse Prince of the Sun on DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, you can pick it up for a pretty good price. I recently listened to the Mike Tool commentary that is on the disc, and it is very informative. Um, I It kind of uh, was a good kind of idea of what anime 
uh, production was at the time. Uh, for example, they said after this movie, uh, Toei decided, you know what? Let's not do salary employees anymore. Let's do contract employees. Mm, oof. And so that's kind of what started our modern <clears throat> anime production today. Because they realized it would just be cheaper by contracting everybody out and having the movies and other productions just be on a skeleton crew. Uh, <laughs> they heard for, that socialist for... message loud and clear and decided to ignore it. Uh, Toei was <laughs> Grinwald all the time! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I highly uh, enjoyed the Mike Tool commentary and just kind of the... Um, the interesting history I learned, and there's a there's also a Takahata interview on the disc as well. Uh, so okay. yeah, there's a bunch of uh, neat little goodies on the DVD. And Tobias, where can we find you? So you can find me on Twitter uh, at wb foreman nine nine nine. That's uh, W B F O R E M A N nine nine nine. Just like the train. <laughs> Just, just like the train, the, the, the S S S S W B Forma. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess since Tobias is going to give his actual Twitter handle, which is Reverend underscore Tobias, I'll go. Um, you can find me on Twitter <laughs> at Calvacun, that is C-A-L-V-A underscore K-U-N. And I also now have an Instagram. Um, and I'm only plugging that because on top of like talking about my regular life, I have started posting stuff from my anime collection. So figures... Uh, Blu-rays, uh, ephemera from my journey in collecting everything Time Bokan, uh, Lum, Yatterman, uh, Frieza stuff, uh, Sailor Moon. So all of that, you can find that on my Instagram, which is Calvacun, C-A-L-V-A-K-U-N, without the underscore. Um, so yeah, that that's us. That's us then, guys. Thanks for listening to us talk about Horus, Prince of the Sun, and we will talk... Or, Words. Fit. Austin, finish me out. <laughs> okay, it's fine. Actually, I wanted. To, I did want to say one thing. So right before uh, we are recording this episode, uh, one day after we published our Belladonna of Sadness episode, um, and because of that episode, we were finally able to reach over the hurdle of getting 10,000 downloads. And that might not sound like a whole lot in the grand scheme of uh, internet podcasts or videos or whatever but uh it means a lot to us that we finally reached this uh, major milestone and we could not have done it without you wonderful listeners so thank you <laughs>